Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Mark Phillips, founder of Nomad Stays. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Uh, good day, Vance. Thanks very much for having me. And um, how are you today? I'm doing well, man. Where are you calling in from today? Super. Uh, so today I'm in the French Alps. Um, so you can hear this accent's not really a, a French accent. Uh, I'm an Australian and mm -hmm. um, we migrated uh, Nomad Stays, our, our startup, a few years ago to France to be in Europe, which is a much bigger travel, international travel location than, than Australia. Um, and uh, so today's a little bit rainy, but it's been a very long, hot summer, uh, mm. which has been um, quite pleasant. Um, from an Australian point of view, but the, the locals find it a, a bit hot. Cool. So Nomad Stays, um, tell me a little bit more about that. Tell the audience as well. Okay, sure. So uh, Linda and I, the, my partner and co-founder, we've travelled a lot of the world um, as tourists, as expats, we've worked um and enjoyed around the world. So we decided back in about 2015 that we would go full-time travel as digital nomads. Mm -hmm. And um, building businesses, travelling full-time, we soon learnt that it was actually quite difficult to fit together lifestyle features for, that were affordable and, and suitable that were needed to do business and keep moving. And particularly at that time, we travelled with our, our pet dog. So I had worked in the travel industry before. I'd run a travel startup before doing outback stuff. I'd worked as a director of an international hotel school. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the, a lot of the accommodation places around hotels, apartments, resorts, didn't have great occupancy. Yet, there's people like us that want to stay for a few weeks but not pay leisure tourism prices. So we tested this in Australia as we were lapping the country, so to speak, and mm -hmm. um, we were making more money, or the, the properties were making more money, even though they weren't getting as high a nightly rate, but because guests like us were staying a lot longer than their average, they, the, the properties were getting some great money in their bank accounts, and we were getting great affordable rates. So we turned that into a business. Well, Airbnb definitely needs some competition, that's true. <laughs> well, uh, Airbnb, well, put it this way, they're, they're the biggest copycats of us. Uh, really? When we launched, oh, yeah, absolutely. When we launched four years ago, Airbnb had almost no instant bookings. They had no uh, pets. They only turned pets on as a searching mechanism this year, 2024. Um, they didn't really do much on the availability side and they certainly didn't do long-term rates. Uh, and even at the time, Booking.com, they approached us and tried to do a deal, but Booking.com, they couldn't book anything more than 28 days. So it didn't really suit the, the nomad stuff. But, um, right. yeah, Airbnb, Airbnb's copied about 20 of our innovations since those times and um, as, as well as the marketing about nomads and adventure and, and exploring for a great life. Hmm. And I'm on nomadstays.com right now. Um, sure. I, uh, I guess I, for transparency, I have not used it yet, but I'm, I'm down to use it. And it looks very reasonably priced. And um, you're very clear about how the, the Wi-Fi is verified as being good, which is great. Mm -hmm. It says 80 plus countries. And so I, I typed in Spain. I wanted to see what's going on in Spain. Uh, and I typed in uh, monthly, and it, I'm seeing an all-in price. I see one in Andalusia for a thousand bucks flat. I yep. see another one for one thousand one hundred in somewhere called Torre Vieja. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the so the prices are very reasonable. Thousand eleven hundred. We've done that on purpose, um, particularly in regional areas. Uh, people don't usually get a lot of tourists coming through but they've got some great properties they've got a lot of lifestyle stuff and you get some great internet services in many parts of the world today so we negotiate with these properties and we say listen if we're going to bring somebody in for a month we want a great price because a great price will attract a digital nomad 
Um, and, you know, it doesn't stop you doing leisure business, but your typical booking.com uh, or Airbnb booking, well, they're three or four days, whereas we're averaging about a month. So we, we basically get great prices, um, particularly off-season. Mm-hmm. And is there a focus on sort of co-living or, or is it more independent apartments and units? Uh, it, there's a whole range of properties there, Vance. We've got boats, we've got vans, we've got apartments, we've got hotels, we've got camping sites, um, you name it, it, it's there. The, the co-living um, element is sort of in a, it's a high growth area here, 2024, um, sort of moving on from the hostel world of a few years ago. But largely you'll find uh, today that um, most of our properties are going to be independent apartments, either in a hotel or an apartment block or a standalone house somewhere. Cool. I like it. Hmm. And you've been running Nomad Stays for nine years now, I think it's said. No, we've been Nomad Stays launched four years ago. So four years ago. Uh, we've okay. been Nomads for, for nine years um, and we, we visit about 20 countries a year. Uh, you know, just last week I was in, I had to go up to Paris, went over to Serbia for some business traps. We came back. Next week I'll be in Switzerland twice, then we're on our way to Croatia. So we, we travel a lot. Um, and, um, uh, and so, you know, we, when we took the idea of creating the business, we tested it, found the market, um, and then created the site of which we launched four years ago. Uh, I think we were in Bulgaria when, and we launched. And do you have a team of software developers? Do you code yourself? Well, I'm I'm out of the tech industry, but I'm not out of the development side of the tech industry. In my past, I worked for Apple for a while and Microsoft and worked in sales and management and projects. Um, but to be honest, I've learned to code uh, since starting this business. It, it gives me a chance to create the shell of what I'm looking for, give it to my developers and say, this is what I'm looking for. Please go out and fill it in and make sure it works. So it, it sort of speeds up our development. And we use a variety of developers, um, depending on their skills, from all parts of the world. Very cool. Have you raised venture capital? We have not, no. Uh, actually, we're just doing a first raise now. Um, we're, we're going for a pre-seed round, uh, about a million dollars. And um, fingers crossed, I've got a meeting after this call with uh, an investor that's looking at about 300000 of that to, as our first big investor. So we hope to close uh, around in the next, uh, say, six or eight weeks. That's amazing, yeah. man. And so all, all bootstrapped up to, up to this point in time. <laughs> and I think you said you moved to France like four years ago. So you, the, the, the launching of this business kind of coincided with moving to France? Uh, we we got um, oh as you know visas are an interesting topic. Um, the the French don't have a nomad visa, but they do have a tech entrepreneur visa, and so we pitched nomad stays to the French tech um, part of the French government. We said we want to build this business; it doesn't exist elsewhere in the world, and we'd like to do it from France. Will you give us a, a residency permit to stay here? And they said yes. Um, wow. The French tech visa, it's, it's quite inexpensive. I think uh, $250, $300 for a four-year visa. Uh, income level is quite low. I think it's about 1500 a month. Um, but you've got to be sponsored. So mm-hmm. we looked around at the accelerators and incubators that would be good sponsors. And we really came down to Paris, which everybody knows, um, or the French Alps. French Alps is all about tourism. It's not all about tourism, but it's a very big tourism region. And so we received sponsorship from a very large uh, incubator uh, area uh, near the ta- near the city of Chambéry. Uh, mm. So Chambéry is uh, on the on the Alps side of Lyon, I guess. And um, and they've been great to work with. So um, we're, we're really happy with these guys. Is that where you're based now, Chambéry? Yes, uh, just outside of Chambéry, I'm, I'm based. Uh, I'm in a little village, um, and uh, France is just beautiful, and 
it's actually quite cheap um, if you know where to go and looking. Um, even even Paris, you can get some really good prices and live there very comfortably, certainly by European standards. Um, so I'm about an hour's drive from Lyon. So if I need to catch a plane, so I was, um, catch a plane from Lyon or Geneva, also about an hour's drive. And there are trains and um, uh, buses and things like that, very well connected. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that was a bit of a uh, culture clash for you, because I see your <laughs> sort of your personal branding on Twitter, on X, and it's very, um, what do you call it, like outback, like Steve Irwin, you got the hat, you're like, you know, one of those like Indiana Jones kind of guys, at least that's the way it's kind of presented. Even, even I see you got one of those hats in the, in the background yeah, on the video here. I do, yes. Was, was, a li- <laughs> was it a little bit of an adjustment going to the French house? Uh, well, I guess all of that comes from the fact that my first startup was an outback travel company. Uh, we grew an outback travel business, all inbound business, into Australia many years ago. We uh, did a lot of four-star markets with a lot in the Alps and the deserts and so forth, and that was our uniform. Um, the, the the picture of uh, uh, of me in the in the desert that you refer to on Twitter that was taken in the Sahara, mm-hmm. actually an area of the Sahara called the Tenerain, when I was out there a few years ago, um, and I now still run some tours out through there. So it all came down from this love of travel, love of adventure. Um, and moving to France, absolutely <laughs> a culture clash. Um, the I still don't speak much French. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a reasonably conservative country um, and because there's not that much English here compared to a lot of other Europeans, the, the French tend to stay quite close to home. Yet Linda and I, well, we've travelled more than 100 countries, lived all around the world, you know, make things happen at the instant, but, you know, we... The locals here still don't figure out what we're up to and how we do it, but uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're impressed anyway. <laughs> well, it looks like a beautiful area of the country. I'm kind of just clicking around a little bit on Google Maps, doing some street view, and I'm like, dude, I could live here. This looks oh, sick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, 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 obviously, the mountains are beautiful. There's a lot of nature parks here. It was um, it was really interesting. So we, we turned up uh, and we booked a jet. A jet is a French word for a farm stay. We, we booked it near this little town that I'm in right now in preparation to go down to the local uh, government offices, the prefecture as it's called, and, and do our paperwork to get our visas. Two hours after we arrived, the country went into lockdown for COVID. Mm. Um, so we got stuck here for like a year and a half. Um and, and, of course, everybody remembers COVID. It was very confusing, not knowing what's going on. And certainly the travel industry, you know, they lost a lot of business. So the, the manager and the owner of the JIT, where we were, they loved having long-term clients. Um, they loved helping us. And, and the French people really took us under their wing to help us through, obviously, a stressful time and, and even more so for us with our, our lack of language and um, and. and you know, lack of understanding of how the French system works in many aspects. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm not um, an expert in French nationality law, but in a lot of countries, uh, after five years of residency, you can apply for citizenship. Is that how it works in France? Or are you, are you it that is close? absolutely. Yep. Um, this particular visa, the French tech visa, does allow for residency. So in a few months' time, I am um, able to apply for residency. However, they have one test, and that's the French language test. Uh, so I, I'm not really going to pass that anytime soon. So to get that residency, I'm going to have to do some uh, intensive study. But um, in the meantime, I travel with an Australian passport, which is also a very good passport for getting many parts of the world. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, the, And when you the, say the, residency, do you mean citizenship or do you mean like permanent residency? Uh, so it becomes a permanent residency. So I've, we have four-year residency permits right now, and then uh-huh. we move to a 10-year residency in Europe, which is effectively permanent. They call it permanent. Uh, uh-huh. You do have to renew every 10 years, but it becomes an automatic process. Okay, interesting. Um, and, then, and then you can apply for that 
passport, if you wish. So there's, there's a couple of different stages depending on, on what you're really looking for. Um, the main thing is the residency. So like Americans, Australians can't stay in Europe for very long under the standard tourist visas. The, uh, usually most people talk about the Schengen visa. Mm -hmm. Schengen countries, uh, you can stay basically three months out of six and then you have to get out of the Schengen region for three months before you can come back in. Under, under this residency, we can stay in France uh, and travel very readily all year round in Europe. Mm. Um, it's a bit complex. Uh, there's, there's some old visas and things that get in the way there as well. Americans and Australians and Kiwis, we've got some, some what are called bilateral visas which have precedence over the top of, um, of the Schengen visas. But uh, I don't know if we want to jump into visa stuff, but it's a, it's a pretty complex area. Uh, yeah, I'm looking on ChatGPT. It says um, five continuous years as a legal resident to be able to apply for citizenship can be reduced to two years under certain conditions, such as completing higher education in France or rendering significant services to the country. So... Oh. It's cool. I didn't. I, that seems like a pretty good uh, path to, to residency in uh, Europe. So, um, but I, I, I would like to go back to um, nomad stays. Hmm. I'm sure you talk to your customers quite a lot. What do they say in terms of why they choose to book with you guys versus Airbnb? I think it comes down to uh, a couple of core reasons. Um, prices. The obvious attractor. You know, a lot of our property is a, a third of the price of what it is on Airbnb. Really? Um, secondly, it's speed. We only do instant bookings. So mm. when you see something that's available, you can book. We, we're not showing you things that, uh, that can't be booked, which are impractical. Mm. Uh, the internet speed, uh, we're about the only platform that does an independent testing of internet speed. So that's Dude, another that's huge. big one. That's oh, huge. yeah, that's it's. We've had to go through a couple of different providers, but we test that, comes into our database completely under our control. So, so that makes a big difference. And then you wind your way down into some of the, say, we call it second tier. Um, we only list properties where there are kitchens, where there are laundries and washing machines. Really? And desks, it has and to have a kitchen for you guys yep. to... Okay. Yep. Oh, a couple of places in Asia, which has got amazingly cheap street food, they're exempt, but 99% of the world, no, um, no, that's a, you know, what it's like, you know, you want somewhere to entertain yourself, you want to cook your own food, you don't want to eat out 365 days of the year. So, so kitchens are mandatory. Yeah, this is unreal. And I, I, I it does, it definitely does seem cheaper than Airbnb. The, the, the model's different. Um, you know, when you're staying at an Airbnb and, and the average Airbnb booking is four nights, the property owner has to do a lot of cleaning and setting up and changeover, and so their costs are higher. They're also, Airbnb, most of their business comes from people that live 100 kilometres away from their home. It's a very domestic business, actually. And so people yeah. are going on leisure and usually on weekends. So they, they go at peak times of the year. And the mm -hmm. tourism industry makes a lot of money in the peak times of the year. Whereas we come along and we say, well, actually, we're going to promote regional areas, great areas that are not necessarily on the tourism map. And then you're, you're staying for a lot longer. So you've got one nomad stays booking, which is an average, I think it's 29 days at the moment, compared to four nights or four days with Airbnb. Which would you prefer? Um, wait, wait, just to re repeat that again, the average Airbnb stay is only four nights? 4.3 nights is the average Airbnb stay. Wow, I would not have guessed that. I would have thought it was over 10. No, no. Well, In fact, their long-term bookings are actually shrinking uh, this year, 2024. Really? As a percentage of, of their business? Yeah, uh, as a percentage wow. of their business. Um, and uh, we've been noticing, obviously, they're the ones that sort of moved into our space uh, was was great when we set the market up. We set this business up pre-COVID. It's three, four, five million nomads around the world. COVID created this massive boom, and of course, all mm -hmm. the big guys started moving into it. So, you know, they could see they had some money there. 
So um, and your average day is twenty nine nights. Yes, yeah, we just do that live. It's 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 published live on the site. So I think it's twenty eight, twenty nine at the moment. But it varies usually up around that that range. So for for its average twenty nine nights, that means a huge portion of people are staying more than a month. Uh, a good a good portion of people, yes. So, um, but but you can you, just... it looks like you can only book one month max. So they're renewing it somehow. No, uh, when you move on to the next screen, you get to add additional days. Uh, okay, you won't necessarily be able to do that until you've logged in, um, got to the details. But you can add you can add extra nights, and uh, and soon we'll release that two month and three month uh, options as well. We're just trying to get mm. the UI right that it's not too confusing for everybody. So I'm pretty much an Airbnb expert. Uh, mm -hmm. um, that, that came that came out a little too braggadocious, but um, so I'll I'll go into some like nitpicky things with you, and you tell me how sure. you guys um, stack up with Airbnb. One thing I noticed um, is that even though I selected a month, and I'm looking at a place in Portugal, when I go onto the actual page of the unit itself. It kind of reverts back to the weekly price. Is that a, a specific choice? So when you go onto the actual page, you'll be presented with the range of options that are available at that point in time by the property. And most properties will have four different prices, one week, two weeks, three weeks, and a month. Um, staying for a month is cheaper per night than staying for a week. Mm -hmm. And you usually get all of those presented uh, when you hit the stays page. Okay. And one other thing I like about um, this website compared to Airbnb is I can see the exact, exact location. Yep. Whereas with Airbnb, they sort of give you like a, a fuzzy approximate location, but it's really important to me. Like I'm so specific about logistics. Mm -hmm. I want to know the location down to the block because... Yep. You know, whether you're at the top of the hill, the bottom of the hill, or whether you're, you know, close to the subway or not close to the subway or uh, all these kind of things make a huge difference. And Airbnb Absolutely. perfect uh, Airbnb purposely doesn't show you, I think, sort of to protect the uh, um, the hosts. Uh, or I, I don't know exactly you, what the logic is, but you may find there's two reasons that they do it. One is to protect their business from leakage where people contact the host and do an independent booking without using the platform. Um, that's probably one reason. But secondly, most leisure tourists don't really care about that stuff. But we nomads, we want to know where the supermarket is. We want to know where the bus station is. Mm -hmm. We want to know where the, the gym is. So, so that's why we said, no, um, it's very important to have exact locations and proximity to those lifestyle features that, that we need as nomads. Yeah, because when I was in my single days, I wanted to book an Airbnb that was like close to the bars, but not too close that I hear the duh, 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 yeah. duh, right? So I wanted to be like strategically like an eight minute walk away, like just far enough that I don't hear the noise, mm -hmm. but close enough that I can walk. You know what I mean? I don't have to yep. take the, yep. the cab. And then I can be like, hey, baby, my place is walking distance, like boom, boom, boom. But with Airbnb, it made it really hard to do because it was approximate. And then I'm like, damn, I don't know if I'm on this side of the block or that side of the block. But with you guys, it, it seems like it's much more transparent. Well, it is. You'll find this heat maps there of both the bar district and the restaurant district. So you can sort of see how far it extends out. Um, you, you know, for instance, you might know of one good bar that you're going to hit that you think is going to be the noisy one. You may not be aware that the next street over there's two more bars that are going to be equally as noisy. Now, if you're mm. in the street next to the two noisy ones, um, you know, you've, you've sort of defeated the purpose. So we use some heat maps to sort of show where the greatest concentration of entertainment areas, restaurant areas and so forth are. Mm. Okay, so I'm signing up right now, uh, free to sign up. Um, do you guys use promo codes at all? We haven't pre-planned this, but... We have not, no, we haven't pre-planned it. And no, uh, we, we do have some promo codes um, that they're used in limited circumstances at the moment. We, uh, probably like a lot of nomads, are struggling with the changes in the banking industry at the moment. And so we're in the process of changing our, 
uh, bank providers uh, and some of the promo codes and how those are, are handled uh, waiting on the new bank uh, integration going in. Okay, but, so uh, no uh, no code My Latin Life for 50 bucks off or something? Well, yeah, you know, we run on about a 12% margin. We're about the lowest margin out there, so we don't have a lot to give away. Um, so we, we said, okay, we're not going to do artificial deals and specials and stuff like that that run through all the travel industry. We're just going to have great prices all the time. Um, and then uh, say, so great, you've got your great price. Now the important thing is what are you going to do when you're there? Who are you going to engage with? How are you going to meet other people? How close are the co-working centres? What are the events coming on? So do we spend more mm-hmm. time on, on getting more into your life than worry about the colour of your bedspread? This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you in part by Crema Social. Crema Social is like TikTok for international dating. It's an app you can download right now on your phone, and three out of four people on Crema are single women. The app was founded in Colombia, so unsurprisingly, there are a lot of Latinas on the app, by the way. So how does it work? Crema Social is a social meal experience where you invite a hot girl for a lunch date via video call and food delivery. New concept, so you'll have to try it out for yourself, but this is probably the best way to meet Latinas before you visit the country. So if you're in Latin America or planning to visit Latin America, download Crema Social now and start getting dates right away. There will be a link in the description to download or just search Crema Social on your favorite app store. Have fun, guys. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you in part by BitRefill. BitRefill is the best way to spend your crypto in Latin America. Purchase gift cards or mobile refills from more than 3,500 brands in 186 countries instantly, safely, and privately. You can also apply the code MYLATINLIFE at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you in part by Job Stacking. If you are a remote or hybrid worker looking to maximize your earning potential, then Rolf Holtze, the author of Job Stacking, guarantees you'll be able to double your income. This is the exact system Rolf has used to take his own income and those of many others beyond 20K a month. So what is Job Stacking? It's this idea of working multiple remote jobs. You might have heard Rolf, he's worked five, seven, even nine remote jobs at the same time before. And by the way, job stacking works equally well for non-technical roles. So no, it's not just for the nerds. So if you're ready to job stack, then book a discovery call with job stacking and see how they can double your income in just nine weeks. In the show notes in the description, there will be a link where you can book a call directly on the Calendly of job stacking and be talking with them as early as tomorrow about how to double your income as quickly as possible. Okay. Yeah. So I just logged in. Um, Actually, tell tell me about the margin. Uh, Do you have an idea of what Airbnb's margin is? Yeah, they, well, they're a public company, so they have to share a lot of their financial information, which is Uh great for people like us to be able to learn more about them. They last time I saw they were running on average about seventeen or eighteen percent. But what tends to happen is that they'll discount in competitive areas because you know they're the smallest of the big three uh, platforms, so they're competing with the Expedia Group and the Booking.com Group. So they discount mm-hmm. in some areas, and then they will also um, uh, increase their prices elsewhere. But uh, the the main issue that you find with, with Airbnb is that when they do a longer stay, they just multiply the average, the normal nightly rate by 10 or 20 or 30. And, and so um, mm-hmm. uh, they maintain I, I, I always try to get those month discounts, right? And so basically mm-hmm. it's like you have to stay for a minimum of 28 or 29 nights for that monthly price, price to apply. So I always try to do that. Yep. Um, but... Uh, you don't what have to the, stay, of course. You don't have to make the booking. You can leave early. 
you don't get your money back, of course, but you know, um, the you generally find that 28 days kicks in because there is many parts of the world where the tax laws change and the regulations change for bookings over 28 or 30 days. Mm-hmm, right. So, yeah, like a lot of places actually allow or they're more open to bookings longer than 30 days. Correct. And, yeah. and some, some places are anti them. So it, the logistics of um, global travel in this sort of space is, is a nightmare and getting a lot worse, I must admit. The, the new taxes and re- uh, regulations kicking in uh, are going crazy around the world at the moment. Yeah, like in Canada, my um, my cousins have an Airbnb property and they can do up to six months at uh, as a short term. Mm-hmm. And then the other six months has to be minimum 30 nights. <laughs> you know, you need to be a maths expert to be able to get the right to, to run a little <laughs> gig economy business these days. Um, yeah. It, it, it's tremendously complex. Um, I see in... State of Victoria in Australia, they've just introduced a 7.5% tax on all short-term rentals. Uh, in New Zealand, they've determined that you have to do a, not just your sales tax, but you have to do a special tax as well uh, on a something as low as $2,000 US a month. So these regulation changes are overheads that the hosts and platforms like us have to deal with. Mm-hmm. When it gets too difficult, Platforms like us drop them and hosts disappear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is happening around the world at the moment. There's a shortage uh, of properties, to be honest. Another thing uh, about Airbnb that I don't like and that we tell people is, um, and a common beginner ma- mistake on Airbnb, is they'll book like three months in the same place. Okay? Yep. And um, they'll say, uh, I actually just had a guy yesterday and I was like, ooh, because he was like, hey, man, I just booked my place in Buenos Aires for three months. And I I didn't want to, I didn't have the heart to tell him uh, because he was like, you know, embarking on his LATAM adventure. But we say as a rule, never book longer than one month. And the reason we say that is because the refund policy with Airbnb sucks where they'll only refund you like one month of a three month stay and they Mm -hmm. keep the other two months. It's like absolutely absurd. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you show up to the property and either the Wi-Fi is bad or um, it's right beside a construction site, if you've done a one month rental and you present a good case, it's very frustrating, but you can get your money back. Uh, and so, or like at least a, a decent percentage of your money back. But if you do a three month stay, they'll say, we'll give you one month back and then we keep two months, which is like completely makes no sense. Have you guys, how do you guys, have you noticed this? How do you guys address that? Um, so we orientated our business around the, the European Union. And in the European Union, platforms and agents uh, aren't really allowed to set the cancellation policies. The the host is in charge under law of those cancellation policies. Mm. Um, and so we adopt that. We let the, the hosts determine what they're going to do. Now, like most of the travel industry, the more flexible the cancellation policy, the more attractive the property is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we find that as well. That's one of the the one of the differences that a, um, a smarter property will make will allow, they'll allow high flexibility um, and um, without penalty. Uh, and we had one of these last last week uh, with a lady um, who popped down into Sicily. She booked for three weeks. And then after a week, she said, you know what? I've actually been travelling too much. I'm going to leave early. And she said, what do I do? And I said, well, have you mentioned it to your host? She said, no. I said, well, let's go, let's go talk to the host. And off I went, talk to the host. And the host said, that's okay. You know, we recognise that. Here's half your money back. Um, so it was just sorted out and everybody's happy. Um, so, okay. you know, so it's really you, the host you don't have to be a, nasty. Yeah. yeah. So it's really the host that's in kind of the position of power, I guess. <laughs> well, well, the law makes it that way in, in Europe. Uh, um, and I guess with Airbnb, because they're using a lot of gig economy, a lot of people that are not really in the, the tourism industry, they're not registered, they're not on the tourism boards, they don't have business numbers. 
whereas we tend to deal with more professional operators, more people mm. that have got their licences. They know the laws and they know their strengths um, and so we, we're orientated to the professional industry more than the gig economy. Okay, so if someone, you know, books a place, they show up, turns out it's right beside a construction site, um, they got to go to the host and say, hey, can I get a refund? We're beside a construction site. And it's kind of up to the host discretion. They could maybe yeah. say no or something. Oh, well, it's contract law. So, yes, it is up to the host discretion. If they haven't um, publicized that it's a construction site and uh, they're, they're selling it at, a, at you know, normal rates and things like that, then there's an argument that uh, they should have disclosed this. And so the guest might have that right to, to cancel that booking or at least a portion of that booking. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had this uh, last year in Albania. I was staying at a property. I ended up staying three months, but like you do, book a month at a time. And they said to me, said, listen, we're actually doing some more construction and it starts in a couple of weeks. What would you like to do? I said, I'll see how we go, and, uh, depending on how noisy it was. So they, I stayed, construction kicked in. It got pretty noisy. I couldn't do any calls. So I just said to them, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up and move on. It's just I can't work in this environment. I said, no problems at all. Give me a few dollars back and uh, off I went to something else. So good good hosts are like that. You know, they're, they're in the hospitality game. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's one of the nicer things when you're dealing with people that are a bit more geared up, a bit more professional. They've invested their, their effort and money into building a great business. They, they want that for the long term. They want great reputations. Understood. So this, a platform like this, it's a bit of a um, chicken and egg problem, right? Because on one hand, you need the clients yep. or you need the travelers. And then on the other hand, you need the properties. Correct. And so I'm sure it's because um, it's a two-sided marketplace. Correct. So what, what's, what's harder, getting, the, getting the, the traffic of travelers or getting the properties? For us, we have no shortage of customers. We have no shortage of traffic. You know, the last 24 hours, we're just under 1,000 users on the site. Um, wow. But we, we don't have 1,000 free rooms at this point in time. So for us, the supply side, the, uh, the, the hosts, is the biggest issue. Um, and so we're, not only are we trying to find those individual hosts, but we're also working at um, integrating with some of the big middlemen, big bed breaks and things like that, um, other platforms that have unused inventory and, and working out whether they can supply what we need, which is actually a lot harder than you might think because the travel industry, as you were talking about before, they don't have Wi-Fi speeds. They don't, many of them don't even keep the fact that there's a laundry nearby or mm-hmm. washing machines or, or kitchens, ovens. This sort of information that we require isn't, isn't historically been kept in leisure properties. So we tend to have to deal with um, more boutique sort of uh, suppliers. But you know, right now, I'd love an extra 30,000 rooms. So if anybody's got a whole lot of rooms, please give me, please hit me up. That's cool. I like it. I really do like the heat map. I think it's well done. Yeah. Did you have to like roll your own here or what API is this? <laughs> Uh, we get most of this information from a Spanish partner. We modify a few things over the top of that. Um, so um, we, we feed them GPS coordinates and locations and names and, and then they give some information and collectively we present that in the formats that, that you see. Mm-hmm. And so um, Nomad Stace has been up for about four years now. Have you had any inflection points in the business, whether it be uh, newspaper articles or uh, things like that? How, tell me some stories about, uh, about that. Uh, so, yeah, we, when we did our testing, for instance. We did it on Product Hunt or something like that. And, you know, I think we signed up 300 users in the first 24 hours. So that gave us a, a good boost that, yeah, we're really onto something here. We had already tested to some extent with um, the hotel industry around Australia through personal contacts. And, and so we knew that we, and I guess years in the travel industry, we knew the sorts of pressures that hotels went. So that wasn't too hard. And then we put the product together. We sort of got outed by some trade magazines. So it went 
out before we were ready, quite ready to launch. So it was quickly finished that code and <laughs> turned the website on. Um, and then it got picked up by a whole range of media um, pieces. We did a few releases. So I think we've been in Forbes, the um, Financial Times in England. Um, we've got some stuff coming out right now. I, some of you may have seen that I was um, uh, very lucky to uh, fly to Serbia recently with uh, President Macron from France and do a, uh, a startup and AI mission with the, uh, the Serbian president. Mm. So that's resulted in a whole lot of media uh, coming, coming around as well. Um, uh, and then a lot of trade magazines. So you'll see a couple of our partners on the page there, uh, Travel Massive, uh, Work From Anywhere. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've had a, a moderate amount of media, um, probably 30, 35 major stories in four years, so moderate amount. But most of our, our sort of um, popularity is really coming from great SEO, um, when people are searching for somewhere to stay, because we're not we're not a, a casual information site or, or a blog site, which isn't really time sensitive. You know, people are looking for somewhere to stay. They go looking for platforms of people that can book them. Uh, so that's that's one big area, and also social media. Uh, and I guess being in the travel industry for uh, in the tech industry for 20, 30 years, the the social media is um, is a decent size of what we're doing as well. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be there's a little bit of a focus on like, I guess you could say like rural properties or second tier cities and stuff. Like I don't see like too, too much in say downtown Lisbon or downtown Madrid. Would that, would that be accurate or, or am I off base? No, you, you are accurate. A um, couple of reasons for that. Um, interesting. So Lisbon's got this, this big issue for a while there. We had we're running at our peak about 500 properties in, in Lisbon, 500 rooms. Uh, that's all been soaked up in the last couple of years. The the mass uh, arrival of um, Portuguese-speaking students is the biggest increase in the population in, in uh, Portugal and Lisbon in particular. So a lot of students have moved in downtown. Uh, Portugal developed a great reputation during COVID, or particularly in Madeira. So... Mm-hmm. Portugal became a, a really popular place for a lot of Americans as their first entry into digital nomad life from, from the States. So, so it got reasonably popular and now it's going the opposite. You know, the, the government changed the laws. They put a 10-year moratorium on apartment rentals and things like this. So um, it's going backwards. Prices are dropping. Um, you know, two and a half years ago, we were selling apartments in Lisbon for $500 uh, and I'm I think the last time I looked at one we had available was about seventeen hundred in, mm-hmm. uh, in Lisbon. Madrid uh, also is a high tourist place, so what you find is tourist places are, are difficult for long term nomads because if you've got a property that's used to doing business in the leisure industry and they're used to doing having their weekends booked up, now they might have the next year worth of weekends booked up or half the weekends booked up, and if you turn up and say, listen, I want to stay for a month, and they say, well, we can't because we've actually got the weekends already sold. And so it's it's a lot harder to get a an existing short-term rental to take on long-term rentals because they just don't have enough availability. Right. Um, and so what's happening, what's happening in Madrid, it's a well-known area, there's developments of new hotel complexes which are hybrid uh, properties, hybrid apartment complexes that are designed for both long-term and short-term living. A lot of those developments are not yet completed, so that's going to change Madrid, you know, especially in the next couple of years. Okay. Um, random question. One thing about Airbnb that's quirky is how uh, when you when you're in the chat functionality with the host, you know they don't they don't want to share the numbers, and they obviously yeah. have like written some code so that yeah. they don't really like share the, their phone numbers with you because they don't want you going off platform. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, maybe you get a deal off platform and, and uh, you know, Airbnb misses out on their on their fee. Hmm. Uh, what, what's your guys' philosophy on, on that kind of thing, like the communication between the host and the guest? Uh, we don't have communication, direct communication inside our platform. So once the booking is made, um, the communication is direct between you, whichever platform you want to use. 
um, in the meantime, if you have questions, it comes back through our team. So we, we filled your questions and we um, often the answers are actually there in the information on the property so we can answer it immediately. And sometimes we just need to ask some questions so we go and ask the hosts, um, as you would any other travel agency that, that is handling your, your bookings. Okay, so the communication is really with you guys and not with the host? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So a typical travel agency, you know, with a, when you're going down to see a travel agency to book your flight around the world, you don't, you don't get to talk directly with the uh, suppliers and things like that at that point in time. The, the, the messaging communication is much more of a gig economy sort of activity, and uh, we are looking at it. But for exactly the reasons you're talking about, we need to set up filtering to stop sharing of these sorts of um, alternative booking mechanisms so we don't lose out on the business. So we don't want to do all the work for nothing uh, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, lose, it, lose the business. Because mm -hmm. even a lot of the places I see listed, there are co-workings and things like that, and they're using like a brand name for the property. So it doesn't say like cute guest house or something. It says... Finca co-living or something yeah. like that. So you could kind of just like copy paste that, throw it into Google, see if they have a website, yep. maybe go to them directly or something. Yeah, that's true. Um, but in reality, when you go to those properties, they don't have long-term rates because they're usually set up for short term. Mm. Uh, they probably don't have their availability there on their website. Again, most small websites don't. Uh, they may not have online payments. Um, so mm. you, you don't get to book uh, with a credit card and it's get the security of credit cards. So, so again, there's some inherent strengths of dealing with platforms that, that we can de-risk a lot of that um, for you. Yeah, definitely makes sense. I was checking if there was a filter for parking. Is there one? Good question. Um, we do have a field in there, but I'm not sure if it's turned on at the moment. Uh, no, yes, it is. Yeah, it should be there. Um at the, at the state level. Okay, so there should be a, a parking one. Because yeah. I was thinking, I don't know how you do it. Do you do you have a, uh, like a camper van or something? Uh, we've got a car and a motorcycle and sometimes both together. So, um, again, uh, I'm just trying to think of, we haven't had any, any problems with the parking. We've got uh, EV charging these days, so you can... Work out whether you need to go is that down a filter? the street. Is there an EV charging filter? Yeah, there is EV charging. Yeah, it's a, oh. it's a filter there. We don't have a lot of information there. There's not a lot of EV chargers out there just yet. Uh -huh. um, and the uh, and the very cool ones is some properties in, in Greece, for instance, that are putting in heliports. So they're getting ready for the flying cars, which which are already oh being God. used in certain parts of the world. So yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're already in in trials in around the world. So we're now talking a couple of years until you're going to see some flying cars zipping around. Okay, cool. Yeah, because what I would want to do, what I'm kind of envisioning for myself is at some point I want to get, um, um, I want to get like an RV in Europe and rip mm -hmm. around and I see your platform being perfect and I can do like one month here, one month there and kind of explore mm -hmm. all of Europe and I know I'm going to have a good spot, good Wi-Fi community and stuff like that. I just yep. need to make sure if I, I have parking or not because, I mean, as an American, I... I know that parking in Europe can be difficult sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah. Little little streets, little narrow towns. A um, lot of lot of the average RVs that they use in Europe, are, you know, they're really stuck to main roads and highways. Um, the medium size, certainly US medium size RVs, are more popular here, but really because of the small roads and and to get to some of the great attractions, you want something a little bit smaller. Yeah. Um, but then there's a lot of camping areas as well. So um, you can camp for a small amount of money, if not free, in lots of parts of Europe. Go up mm -hmm. to Scandinavia and, and I think you can camp on farmers' yards, farmers' lands uh, without checking. It's very, very easy up there. Uh, and then, and so you'll find some camping spots uh, on our platform. We've got a few that just come to mind in um, Croatia. I'm heading over to have a look at some of those in about three weeks' time. So um, you'll, you'll find we've got camping spots uh, where you can park the RV as well as those with cabins and, and apartments as well. 
No. Yeah, the, the whole idea is not to limit the style of accommodation that you have. Yeah, and, you know, as we travel the world, we want to we want to discover things, and you know, if that means that you're going to stay in a tent somewhere, <laughs> so be it. Well, you know, you, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Africa, and when you, you, you backpacking through Africa or exploring Africa, you're obviously in a in a safari tent, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, some of these are fairly sophisticated. But you know, why limit why, why limit the platform to certain types of things uh, when, in our case, we're dealing with such adventurous global people? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Speaking of adventurous people, and I guess your your lifestyle, you have a, f- a pretty a fun life, I guess. You get to just oh, yeah. Try trip hard. around Europe and, and check on these properties, and they probably roll out the red carpet for you, and they're cracking bottles of wine. Tell me, it m- must be a fun business. Yeah, it, it, travel is a fun business. It's a hard business. It, it, it's one of those industries where it takes a few years before you're accepted because of such high turnover of businesses that fail very quickly in travel and tourism. But when you get past that, you're dealing with people whose fundamental nature is hospitality and they love showing off, they love educating you, taking you to places that are not on the maps. Um, you know, and this is, this is here in France, this is just amazing. You know, we'll, we'll go to little cheese manufacturers that only open for two hours once a week or a farm that sells, <laughs> you know, uh, meat directly from the farm we'll just get this beautiful food fresh no preservatives no freaking flyer miles in the food and and you know places that are you know there's no such things as a google map there uh, there's you, you're not going to find them so you need the locals so you need those um those friendly people and when you're in a longer stay or what we call the midterm stays you get a chance to meet and spend a decent amount of time with your host and as they warm to you and, and uh, find you pleasant, as most nomads are, they start introducing you to their network, introducing you to their friends, introducing you to others, and, and you know, it just suddenly you've got a whole network of friends when you stop only for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Right, because I think that's something that Airbnb has lost where it's become so um, commercial and impersonal where – you know, they just treat it like a business. There's no, there's no like host interaction. Like, I don't think I've in years, I don't think I've ever had a host be like, Hey, let me show you around town or, or this kind of thing, or, or even stop to chat. Like it's so impersonal now. So, so it to, seems like you guys still have that, that touch. We have a different focus. You know, Airbnb is a great business, but it took them 17 years before they made a profit. Um, they started as a as an overflow for a conference, and this is their major business. It's it's alternative accommodation for business or uh, event people. They've had all these experiments, and this is the strength of Airbnb. They keep experimenting with things. They don't lock themselves in. So they've experimented with digital nomads, but I don't think they've done any marketing for a nomad for at least 18 months now. They've experimented with hosts being friends, they experimented with their first experiences, host-driven gig economy tours and things. And, you know, it's hard when you're a big business like they are. They, they have to do things that have mass impact. Otherwise, it doesn't move the bottom line and therefore the shareholders are not happy and, you know, things get worse. As a smaller company, we take a different view. We're, we're here to help people get a great life. Accommodation, tours and things like that we've got on there, that's just part of it. If we can make it easier for you to go and explore, set yourself up in great business, whatever, and, and become global, then we've achieved it. You, you've got a better life than being stuck somewhere that you were forced to, to stay in. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm genuinely impressed by what you built. Um, it's amazing. So I think uh, when I get over to Europe, which I'm planning to um, pretty soon, Super. Uh, I, I think uh, this is what I'm going to be using. Yeah, um, I, I didn't realize how Airbnb, and it's true. Like I kind of thought Airbnb was more tailored towards digital nomads, but it's not like they're not really improving it as much as they should be. And I guess you're kind of telling me why that, you know, the average stays only four nights, which kind of explains why they're not making things better for the long-term traveler. No, they had a go. 
Okay. Um, and in that go, they copied a lot of our stuff. Okay, that's business that happens. But it, it's not a big enough movement to move the dial when you're that big. You know, the, the leisure tourism industry is much, much larger. And then when you look at the fine, you drill down into how their business operates, where most clients, 92, 93% of their clients, are booking an Airbnb less than 100 kilometres from their home, you realise that there are Airbnbs actually a, a global collection of domestic rental agencies. Mm. And they're not really a travel agency. They're, they're, they're a local property rental place in lots of countries. Whereas coming from a nomad point of view, we're looking at, shit, how do you travel across borders? How do you, you know, solve some of these residency issues? Um, so we've got an advanced visa tracker that we'll bring out shortly, for instance, that will start tracking the days that you are in certain countries to make sure you don't overstay your visas because that gets really complex depending on which passport you're travelling under. So, so these are travel-related. These are lifestyle-related things for people that travel more, like digital nomads. Yeah. R- random question. I heard, uh, particularly in France, there's these sort of um, wine stay programs where it's like mm-hmm. a camping thing where mm-hmm. you can camp at wineries basically for free if you just buy a, a bottle mm-hmm. of wine, something mm-hmm. like that. Have you integrated with, uh, with this, um, this thing? Uh, I'm just trying to think of the wineries that we have, and I'm, I'm in a wine region. No, we haven't got any of those in France. Uh, they do exist. Um, in France, there's a very big network called Jits in France. It's, I think it's almost 100 years old. It's been a booking agency for French to book farm stays. And farm mm-hmm. stays is what they call a shit. It's, it's a big business here. Um, and to be honest, Wine is really cheap here. You know, literally, I don't. We rarely spend more than four dollars on a bottle of wine, and the local winery, it's even less, and they deliver to the house. <laughs> you know, because it, the, the, the winemaker lives down the road, sort of thing. Um, so the the winemakers in France are naturally very hospitable. Um, they they might be a little bit smaller than say a US and Australian winery because you know it's a bit more lucrative here or lower cost of living so that and they don't have that much land. Um, but, uh, no, we, we haven't got any of those on the platform at this point in time. In fact, th- I was in a conference a month ago with an industry and it's the first time in four years in France that I didn't have to explain to the industry what a digital nomad was. They're, mm. they're, they're a bit more fixed in their views, a bit more conservative, and here in the Alps they've made so much money over 100 years from snow tourism you know, they, they haven't really needed to sort of traverse out of that. Sure, sure. So you, you learned to ski yet? Uh, I used to be a skier, but, um, yeah, not not these days. I, I, part of my youth I spent in um, at an international uh, sporting level and uh, caused a bit of damage to my body, so it's not really designed for cold weather and <laughs> high-impact sports. Okay, so you're working on the French, you're uh, yeah. learning how to ice skate, and uh, you're, you're having fun over there. Yeah, yeah. actually, I, I, I spend, um, spend my leisure time uh, racing around on my motorbike. That's, that's the fun stuff, all these little towns and places to explore, lots of national parks. It's, um, I've, got to, I've got to speak in Switzerland next week. I'm going to jump on the bike and just a couple of hours over the mountain into, into the Swiss Alps and do a talk and then zip on back. Yeah, I think I think France is pretty underrated, and um, and just sort of like the rural region in general. So, it's it's a big tourism industry. It's the number one most visited country in the world, uh, followed closely by Spain. Um, and I was saying to some people just uh, last week, um, I said one week of tourists in Spain and France is equivalent to one year of tourists in Australia, and that's the reason that. Why, as an Aussie, we've got our business based here in Europe. It's just much bigger. Mm. And I'm sure the cost of living is lower in France than it was in Australia. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, you know, our, our rent is usually in the 600 to 800 dollars a month. Um, for you know, in this case, we've got a three-bedroom apartment. Wow. Um, 
Food is probably equivalent to Australia. Uh, it's, food is cheaper in Germany, for instance, by about a third, uh, a little bit less in Italy. Um, really? But then you've got the internet. So we $20 a month, you've got unlimited data on your internet, uh, on your phone calls. You can roam 100 countries of the world. Um, so you Unders and overs, every country is different. They're regulated differently. The taxes are different and, and um, you know, overall, but France is not an expensive place to live, that's for sure. Cool, cool. So you're enjoying your European life. You're building Love Nomad it. Stays. You're uh, looking to raise a little bit of money. If anyone's listening to this, they can get in touch with Mark and participate in the round. Um, I guess uh, we'll get to wrapping up here. Do you want to share kind of a final message with the audience? Oh, I, I just invite you to come and explore Nomad Stays, register, get on the list, find out the opportunities. We, we're we sending out all sorts of information about deals and opportunities as they exist around the world. Um, we've got a whole lot of more um, experiences, tours, retreats, events and things growing a lot at the moment. And, and we're only doing for Nomads. We are 100% for Nomads. We're not doing leisure or any other industry. So we're very, very focused on the sorts of things that nomads uh, prefer more than than other travelers amazing great business dude thanks Vance. Uh, you've got a great business as well uh, i've been reading all through the, the massive amount of knowledge you've got wrapped around your, your your website there and all these consultants helping people all around the world get their residences and things set up it's you've done a lot of work <laughs> it, it doesn't come very easily for sure Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, well, yeah, this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Again, my guest today, Mark Phillips, nomadstays.com. I highly recommend everyone sign up, create an account. I'm sure it'll help Mark a lot. And it'll help you, the, uh, the listener, have a, an alternative option to Airbnb because Airbnb kind of gets worse and worse every year, honestly. So uh, I, I think we finally have found a, a valid alternative and i look forward to using nomad stays in the near future thanks very much friends hey guys quick note at the end of the episode here if you made it this far you might be interested in working with my latin life personally to make progress on your internationalization plan so whether the next step for you is getting residency in latin america lowering your taxes choosing the best country maybe a little birth tourism, whatever the next step is for you, of course, My Latin Life can help. We've helped people in their 20s, their 40s, their 60s, because I truly believe that Latin America has something to offer people at every stage of life. So if you wanna become our VIP client, if you wanna work with Vance, myself, directly, book a call, there'll be a link in the description. There will be a small fee, for the initial consultation and we do that to filter out the time wasters and focus on the best of the best clients but if you're listening to this podcast and you made it all the way through the episode i know you're the best of the best but we're ready we're ready to work with you so book that call hope you enjoyed this episode of the my latin life podcast and we'll catch you in the next one